anybody. Well, let's talk about theology. This is how we're doing. Now, I do, but I figure that's an aberration, you know, and I try not to inflict it on harmless passers-by and people on airplanes and things like that. <laughs> However, you came on purpose and voluntarily, so I'm delighted to see you. Please tell me if I need to pin this microphone on. I didn't yes. feel like yeah. it. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yes, absolutely, you got it. Hang on a minute. Oh, you're recording. That's never a good idea. <laughs> I'm going to be ad living sufficiently that there's really no telling what I will say. Um, and every once in a while, I will in class say something and say, you cannot repeat this. And students all laugh, but they don't listen to me. Uh, somebody needs to show me how to work this. Sweetheart. It's working. It's working. It's working. Then I'm just going to get in here and hold it, which is absurd. But we'll work. Do you want it on your ear? <laughs> I'm, 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 can you tell the technology is not my strength? It took me three years to agree to use email. You know, which is why I'm so crazy about hybrid courses. I never have any clue what I'm doing. Okay, there you go. You can hear me that time. So the trouble with hearing the Bible in church is that you only get little snippets. You know, three verses here, six verses there, ten verses the other place. Rarely does the lectionary even give you a whole chapter, and sometimes it's literally two sentences. This is like trying to listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in little sound bites while on hold on the telephone, <laughs> constantly interrupted by a recorded voice telling you how very important your call is, which they are not answering. Right? It's very hard to get an idea of the shape of the whole. This morning's epigraph, Seek the Peace of the City, is from the 29th chapter of Jeremiah, just a bit over halfway through this long book. It is plucked out of the text of a letter that Jeremiah sends to the first wave of Jerusalem's people taken as captives to Babylon. Before the book is done, most of the remaining inhabitants of the city will have followed them into exile. As the third wave of political turmoil and military conquest to have rolled over the eastern Mediterranean in 20 years will have swallowed up the holy city almost without a trace. It is a dramatic tale. And before we focus on the verse at hand, before we turn it to purposes unenvisioned by the writers, in order to hear what it might have to say to us, let me give you the Cliff Notes version of the plot. To begin with, we have Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, to whom the word of the Lord comes, informing him that he has been called and destined from before birth to be a prophet to the nations. Like virtually every prophet whose call is recorded in scripture, Jeremiah doesn't want the job. <laughs> Which is not surprising, given the nature of the assignment. When God's first words to you are, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will deliver you, you know it's not going to be smooth sailing and good news that you're going to be announcing. But God will not be forestalled. And so when the outpouring of God's heart toward Judah comes, with tenderness and pleading, alternating with threats of doom and destruction. It is Jeremiah, often in anguish, who is the voice of the Almighty. In prose beautiful and terrible, he declares God's <coughs> outraged love and anger. I thought how I would set you among my children and give you a pleasant land the most beautiful heritage of all the nations. And I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Instead, as a faithless wife deserts her husband, so you have been faithless to me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and to Jerusalem. 
circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you people of Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, or my wrath will flare up and burn like fire because of the evil that you have done. Burn with no one to quench. This interweaving of admonition and promise of entreaty and threat goes on for 50 chapters. Interspersed with Jeremiah's grief and despair at Judah's steady refusal to hear <clears throat> that the jig is really up this time and the axe will truly fall. Instead, the people of Judah are disbelieving, outraged, and retaliate by offering to kill the messenger a time-honored strategy, if ever there was one. <laughs> Leading Jeremiah to cry out to God for rescue and repeatedly try to resign his post. <laughs> but God will not, cannot let him go. For God cannot cease crying out through him threats and entreaties imploring Judah for pity's sake to turn <coughs> from idolatry and injustice and live. Till the very end, the word of judgment is punctuated by the word of promise of God's abiding presence. And the last word addressed to the exiles is of restoration and pardon beyond captivity. But as for you, have no fear, my servant Jacob, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for I am going to save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and no one will make him afraid. As for you, have no fear, my servant Jacob, says the Lord, for I am with you. I will make an end of all the nations among which I have banished you, but I will not make an end of you. I will restore Israel to its pasture, and it will feed on Carmel and in Bashan and on the hills of Ephraim and in Gilead, its hunger shall be satisfied. Imagine these words to people who had survived the siege when starvation was rampant and children were dying in the streets. In those days, at that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah and none shall be found. For I will pardon the remnant which I have spared. But of course, the promise is to your offspring. Almost none of those who are carried out from Judah will live to see that retreat. I have taken time to relate this to you because it is important to put our text for the day in its place. It is written after the first of three waves of forced deportation that will eventually leave Jerusalem depopulated and desolate. Its temple stripped and ravaged, the very walls of the city leveled to the ground. It is written by the one man to whom the Lord has revealed all that he has in store for Jerusalem, and to the people who have already gone forth as captives to serve a foreign king, the feared and hated Nebuchadnezzar. 
They are those who wrote the one lament we all recognize. By the rivers we hung up our lives. For our captors there required of a song, <coughs> and our tormentors mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It is important to grasp the broader narrative because unless we understand how hard this word was for them, how unfathomable and astonishing was its advice to seek the peace of Babylon, we will mistake what it meant to them and also what it can mean for us and what it can cost. And thus we are in danger of making sweetness and sunshine of a word that was anything but for those who first received it. So let us stop to look at this passage in a bit more fullness. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply them and do not decrease but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Now this is where we usually end the quotation. But the passage goes on. And here is its point. For that is because, in Greek it's gar, I don't know what it is in Hebrew, I skipped that class. <laughs> For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you and will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. This is at once a word of judgment and Judgment because they are warned. There will be no quick return, no sudden change of heart on God's part that will see them back in the land in their lifetime. But also hope because it reveals that God is not dead, is not on vacation, has not been overcome by the gods of the Babylonians or overawed by their military strength. No. It is God, and not Nebuchadnezzar, who is the author of Judas exile. God picks up and uses the Babylonians to sweep <coughs> Judah out of the land like a broom as God had used the Assyrians 200 years before to drive a faithless Israel from the northern kingdom. And if you read through to the end of the book, you will find out what God has in store for the humbling of Babylon, who imagines that it is her might that has brought God's people low. And by the same token, it is God's own plans that will determine the end of the ordeal. Neither the ambitions of the Babylonians, nor the wishful thinking of the exiles, nor the false declarations of self-appointed prophets, 
but God's sovereign power. And even here, that is a word of profound comfort, that what has happened is not proof of God's weakness or a sign of God's abandonment, but rather is a sign for, of God's will for justice and fidelity among his people. In this letter, the exiles are reassured that God remains the Lord of history and will at length visit and restore his people. In the meanwhile, the letter is addressed to the temptations that faced the exiles, to pin their hopes on human promises, to expend their energies in empty longing to pine away in sorrow and despair, rather than absorb the drastic lesson and grow stronger, even in the strange land of Babylon. But even in this council, it <coughs> is as exiles that they are addressed, underscored by Jeremiah's, or God's, awkward locution <laughs> to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile. You know, don't forget where you are. This is not a calling to assimilate, to deem themselves and their home forgotten, to regard themselves as mistaken in their faith in God, and to become just like those among whom they dwell. No longer exiles looking ahead to a homecoming, but merely happy Babylonian households. <coughs> no, they are to make a life for themselves, to sustain themselves and to seek the welfare of the city by their labor and their prayers. For human life and flourishing are in society by their very nature. But they are also to know themselves as sojourners and not at home. It is a delicate balance being in and not altogether of the world you inhabit. And this, of course, is where the New Testament picks up the metaphor and applies it to the church. Just when you thought I'd forgotten all about the topic. <laughs> we find the language of aliens and exiles <clears throat> explicitly in 1 Peter. I urge you as aliens to keep yourself from the passions that drive the, those around you. But the theme of being in and invested in a world which is yet seen as only a placeholder of being in the world, but not of it, not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you might have the mind of Jesus Christ. All this runs through the writers from Paul and the Deuteropolitan letters, the Johannine works, and even that odd little letter of Jude, which you have not read lately. It is brought home with force and drama, of course, in the apocalypse where the powers and structures that order life in the world are depicted as monsters. And at the very heart of the New Testament's unease is the story of Jesus, who came to the world he had made and found that it knew him not and could not even tolerate the living presence of too much righteousness and so had to get rid of him before he made 30. No wonder the early Christians were uneasy and at least periodically tempted to withdraw from worldly relationships and responsibilities, deciding no longer to marry or no longer to work, <coughs> or even once in a while to go sit on a mountaintop someplace and wait for Jesus to come back. We do that every thousand years or so, by the way. 
<coughs> At one point, Paul has to insist rather acidly that those who decide to abstain from working should also abstain from eating, which seems to bring the impulse to a close. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, these are not our temptations. We are in danger, rather because we have no sense of exile, but are altogether at ease in the modern outposts of Babylon, or Nineveh, or Rome, wherein we dwell. We have not only built houses and planted vineyards, but bought real estate property and taken on agribusiness. Truth be told, we have some trouble identifying with the New Testament. Yeah, I have this thing. <laughs> identifying uh, with the New Testament's appropriation of this language to our own situation. Or even with the old hymns that sing with longing of a home to which we will fly away on some glad morning when this life is o'er. In fact, we are not and do not feel much like poor wayfaring strangers, and we do not really regard death as only going over Jordan only going over home, Johnny Cash to the contrary, notwithstanding. And why does this matter? Because there is a real danger in being too much at home, a risk in investing so unreservedly in the projects of this life and the structures that govern it that we forget that it is not and will never be the kingdom of God. There is a danger that pouring our energies, our thought, our time, our labor into reforming law, into making better social structures, into improving policy, in getting Proposition 47 passed in California that made most drug offenses misdemeanors rather than felonies and therefore ended the drug use to prison to destruction pipeline. All to the good, by the way, that it is not to be mistaken for redemption. If you read the paper this weekend, you know that it features a story about someone kept from prison by that, who then finds their way back onto the street and overdoses on the methamphetamine that they were arrested for. It is vital that we not mistake our sincere and devoted efforts to make the structures that order civil society a little bit better rather than a little bit worse for the project of building heaven on earth. And the risk is twofold. On the one side, there is the risk that we will rest our heart and our hopes on the things we can do with our hands and they will collapse we will have gotten the resolution passed, we will have pushed through the peace treaty, we will have built the United Nations, and the disappointment with what it cannot do will lead us to despair and disillusionment and a final disengagement with the world. Or that it will leave us deeply cynical, unable to invest even limited hopes in the things that we can do, and so tempted to superiority and getting no further in our engagement with the world than satire. That's on one side. On the other side, is that we will persuade ourselves that if we just work harder and do more and try something bigger, we will in fact be able to establish the heavenly city in Washington or Jerusalem or Beirut. And if ever we make the mistake of identifying our projects unreservedly without qualification, with the work and will of God, then we fall into the opposing temptation, 
not that our ability to engage in this life will collapse, but that our ability to see that there is a standard beyond the peace of a sort that we can maintain by a balance of power, a standard beyond the approximation of justice that we can build into a system of social order, that there is beyond that a standard of righteousness and actual peace that continually judges our best work. And if we forget that, then the danger is that in the pursuit of this building of the reign on earth, we will regard anything as justified. And so, from the opposite side, of the tension between exile and investment. The opposite temptation of Jeremiah's exile, who were tempted to despair and withdraw from the world, we who are tempted to engagement in the world and of forgetting that it is not our home, find ourselves confronted with the same pair of temptations. On one side, despair and on the other, idolatry. And history bears witness to the shape of that idolatry, the thousand-year reign of the Third Reich, the politically infused and militarily invested kingdoms that understand themselves as, without reservation, the work of God in the world. And that way lies jihad. So, by another route, we find how important that uneasy balance between our commitment to, our investment in, our prayers and labor for this world, and our recollection that finally it is not Thank you very much for your patient attention, and that's surely enough for this hour of the day, and I'm happy to hear what you all think. I know at 8.30 you don't pick very much, I understand. <laughs> I'm just going to hold this thing because it's not going to stand my ear for Hey, I'm having no trouble sitting down. Yes, sir. So, in the um, the scenario you set up, activism versus kingdom building. In <laughs> <laughs> those were not my words, and I'm not sure I know what you mean by that. But um, it's um, confusing activism getting propositions passed for okay. kingdom kingdom building. Right. Let's let's try engagement. Engagement, okay. okay. Yeah. Engagement versus uh, king book. engagement and kingdom building. Often those two are transposed. Yeah. And if kingdom building is to be the church's ultimate work, what theological basis would you give for the engagement if engagement and kingdom building mm -hmm. are to be understood as separate? All right, let me, let me look at first the language of kingdom building. Okay. Um, I guess I want to say that building the kingdom is and can only be the work of God. We have an extremely limited <laughs> part to play in this, which is at least threefold. One is being ourselves conformed to God's righteous will. Second is embodying in the church a community that constitutes a counterexample, an argument that leadership looks like serving, that God's power looks like weakness. So a significant aspect of the church's political work in the world is to be itself. Okay? And then thirdly, to
to work with the resources at its hand and its passion and commitment to make the structures that order our common life because human life is inherently social. Our flourishing is only together. And therefore, we have a stake for our own sake and for the sake of our neighbors inside and outside the church a stake in investing in making those structures better rather than worse without harboring the illusion that we can approach the perfection of peace and justice. The Christian tradition teaches that peace is ultimately the fruit of order, but not of the order that can be imposed from the outside, but the order that rises up from a heart with rightly ordered love that loves God first and best and its neighbor as itself. And that from that rightly ordered love comes the peace that is the fruit and tranquility of order. And that what we can do in the world where we are resorting to force or threat, to coercion, direct or subtle, is only peace of a sort. Look, it beats the living daylights out of anarchy, don't get me wrong. Okay, But it is not to be confused with the peace wherein lions and lambs lie down together. So I would say the church's work is first and foremost to be itself as a testimony, not only to its faith and its conviction of, and, and God's righteousness, but to constitute evidence that this is not all nonsense. And insofar as we fail to establish a community which is in any significant way distinct, insofar as we let the church contract into the Rotary Club with organ music, <laughs> then we fail in our witness because no one believes or has any reason to believe our testimony to the gospel. It sounds like pie in the sky, by and by, and nonsense. So we have to do that work in order to do credibly and usefully the work of political engagement. If we're going to stand on the street and demand justice and balance and equity in political systems, in police systems, if we're going to demand restraint um, in the use of military force, we have to give some evidence that we're not crazy, that it's not foolish naivete and optimism. And from that posture of giving a counterexample, then our engagement offers something to the world. We can bring a voice to the conversation that would otherwise be absent. So my unease is when we equate our work in engaging the orders and structures of this world, in making the International Monetary Fund wiser and more prudent in how it invests resources and preserves um, both cultural and natural resources in the communities where it invests. For example, to take one project, to become involved in the Jubilee Project and to try to get debt relief in parts of the world where the debt load is crushing social investment. It's not that that's not important. But it's not going to bring about the first century community of the Acts Church where no one has any property and everyone gives from what they have to the needs of those around them. It's not going to, to bring us to the streets of heaven. So, and if we think it will, we're in danger either of lapsing into disillusionment and despair or of regarding our projects as of such preeminent importance that they justify any means whatever. That's how we got the Inquisition. Right? That's, that's how you got the reign of terror in France. That equality, fraternity, and liberty are so important that it's worth chopping off the heads of the people you're not sure you can get to go along. So that's the, that's the tension I'm trying to, to get at. So to engage that 
question. <coughs> would you would you not say that we need a vision of what the kingdom looks like? Yes, I to just don't think that, that we can take plans for the heavenly city and try to erect them in the town square. So how do we convince the world to listen to our vision and not call us crazy? By embodying it. The most potent testimony to the possibility of a society not divided and, and structured along the lines of the mythical social category of race are John Perkins communities, 65 and 70 year old communities in the Mississippi Delta and places where communities of ethnic diversity and common religious commitment live and thrive in, in peace and mutual love. That is a more powerful witness than anything I say about it. I think our political engagement founders on our inability to actually embody anything that looks distinct. A thousand years ago when I was in youth group that used to ask you, have it became a crime to be a Christian? In your case, would there be enough evidence to convict? <laughs> um, and I wonder that about the church. <laughs> if we were charged with being disciples of the Nazarene, could we be convicted? How would anybody know? Insofar as we talk but do not embody, we are just one more voice in the cacophony. Um, Stanley Harawas once described himself as a high church sectarian. A high church Mennonite is actually what he said. Um, and I suppose I'm occupying a, a space a little bit like that, saying that until and unless we can gather ourselves into communities who are shaped distinctively, then our contribution to public discourse is just entirely too easy to discount. Once upon a time, we had a voice because there were so darn many of us, right? How many, how many legions has the Pope, right? Um, and we had uh, the Methodist Church in particular, which served as sort of the chaplain to American culture, had enough votes, if not enough legions, to get political attention. Back in the old days, when sermons were published in the Washington Post, anybody remember that? Um, once upon a time, we had so much cultural weight just by numbers that we had a voice. Those days are gone. And if we wish to have a voice, it will be because we embody an alternative and give hands and feet to our commitments in the world. Okay. Um, I think most of us follow the Pope's visit very carefully. I just wondered if you wanted to talk a little about his vision and his words about ethics and if it relates, it may not. It probably does relate, but I was not among those who followed the Pope's visits and his speeches. Having not had a working TV for 20 years, it's amazing how much goes by. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, I've gotten to be 60 years old without ever, out ever having seen a reality TV show. So they're definitely upside. <laughs> I mean, I, I have read some of the things he's put in print. Yeah. And he sounds like the Catholic te social teaching tradition. On my shelf in my office is a big fat brown book that looks like a Manhattan telephone directory, which is called The Gospel of Peace and Justice. And what it is, is a compendium of the last 135 years of Catholic social teaching about labor, about capital, about working conditions, about ownership of the means of production, about inclusion, about um, empowerment of the underclass, about poverty and the responsibilities of wealth, and so on and so on, dating from the 1890s. And to me, Pope Francis just sounds like a good Catholic boy.
embodying the gospel. And I understand it, that we're speaking as Christians from a Christian perspective. But I'm also thinking of my co-religionists who are Muslim. They um, wouldn't be co-religionists if they're Muslim. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but they do have a faith tradition that's yes. very similar. And so I'm hoping there's room at the table for every person who embodies the best of their faith tradition or their religion. There certainly is, and by nature has to be room at the table. If the table you're talking about is the is the the public table, the table of our shared life, to build houses and plant vineyards, I'm pretty darn sure the exiles had to employ resources and human and otherwise um, who were not among the exilic community. Right? Um, there's a whole other thing about when it says five wives for your sons and so on. Given the prohibitions of intermarriage, that's a sort of interesting problem. But in any case, according to Jeremiah's tally, there are about 5,000, and they're only counting adults, people brought out into exile. So it's a substantial community. But nevertheless, to survive and to do what they are told to do, they certainly have to engage with other people. I would suppose that there is, there probably are projects that I could make sense of and and share with any number of people of different religious traditions and also people of no religious tradition. Um, when the Catholic bishops or the Pope make statements about public policy, almost without exception, they are addressed not just to Catholics, not just to Christians, um, not just to people of faith, but the, the standard phrase is to all persons of goodwill. Um, and there are any number of things we can do and share with all persons of goodwill, I think. Um, in so far as I'm talking about embodying our faith commitments, um, some of those are, are shared, I think, broadly shared, both with other religious traditions and with those outside of any religious tradition. Um, some of them are not. I think liturgy is a morally formative enterprise. I think the communion table is a distinctive model. So there are both aspects that are particularly particular to the community of Christian faith and those which we could readily and naturally share with our parent traditions, which are Judaism, and with the off, third offspring of the Abrahamic traditions, which is Islam, and then others that, you know, um, Somebody, John Steinbrook, who founded the N Street Village community in response to a cold snap that left the homeless dying on the streets of Washington. Right, it's an old, wonderful story. Well, John uh, used to come and talk to my classes once, and once in the room, a student raised a, a critique because Steinbrook was known to have taken money from some of the Thomas Circle developers to invest in his, you know, uh, homeless shelters and transitional housing and child welfare centers, all the things that they built into that, that little block, right? Um, and Steinbrook's response was that he would take money from Beelzebub himself. Um, what better way to reclaim it? He said, this is my version of money laundering. You know, I'm, I'm going to make good of whatever resources I can draw upon. Um, and so I don't think that even being a high church sectarian commits you to withdrawal from the world, and that's not the counsel that this text gives. But it does, it does ask us to realize that we are treading a careful path within a sense of foot in two worlds. And it's very important, I think, to our engagement and to our faithfulness that we not let either side of that tension fall away. So, I'm not sure if that was a satisfactory answer, but off the top of my head, it's like, hey, yes, sir. Can you say a little bit more about uh, the uh, whole expor exploration of liturgy for the churches and where we are? Oh, a really short answer, because a long answer would take a lot more time than we have. There's a whole recent movement, and by recent, I mean the last 25 years. Academics move really slow, so, yeah. you know. 25 years is recent. 
There's a whole recent movement about ethics and liturgy. The way in which the processes, the activities, the routine patterns of our worship, our shared life together, are formative for us in deep and almost, you'll pardon the expression, insidious ways that we're not necessarily aware of. Um, for example, the whole notion of worship. I heard a Jesuit on NPR. How many times do you hear Jesuits on NPR? But I did. I heard a Jesuit on NPR say, that he learned two absolutely vital pieces of good news in seminary. One was that there was a God, and the other was that he wasn't him. <laughs> the discipline of worship calls upon each of us to remember and affirm that there is a God, and that we are not it. And that in itself is a profoundly morally formative thing because it reminds us that we are not in charge and moreover that our not being in charge is really good news. Mm -hmm. I was talking with my 20-something year old son the other night and he was frustrated with things that were going on in the world and he said, I swear if I ran the world it would not be perfect but it would be better than it is now. <laughs> and, and I told him the trouble with you liberals is that you're always in danger of becoming fascists. Okay? <laughs> you know, I can just make this better if I just take power into my own hands. The discipline of worship keeps us from doing that and holds us off from a certain temptation. It says that the world is not lost. The world is not alone. <laughs> the world is in fact governed and we are not its governors. And that itself is a morally formative activity to begin with. The practice of prayer brings us into the possibility of intimacy with God and reminds us and requires us both to speak and to listen, to stop with our hands and open our heads and our hearts for a while to retreat from our enduring temptation to continual busyness, which renders us finally deaf, dumb, and blind because we can no longer see. Well, I mean, so I, I could go on like that through all of the practices of Christian faith. Um, I actually, if you're interested, email me. I'll send you a little chapter of a book that walks through the aspects of Christian practice and how they're morally formative. But way beyond that, there's a rich literature about this. Yes, sir. Uh, how hard is Western Seminary working at that whole liturgical understanding? Most of the way you work at it is honestly by practicing it rather than talking about it. It is by having chapel Tuesday morning and Tuesday night and Wednesday night and having all of our students we be required to spend a year at minimum in covenant discipleship groups where they meet for joint prayer and discernment where they ask each other how is it with your soul and have to give a straight answer speaking of morally formative disciplines telling the truth in front of people praying alone to god in your closet your prayers and confessions a walk in the park as opposed to sitting across the table from someone whose respect you'd like to keep and telling the truth. So we do it more than we talk about it. Um, and how good a job? I don't know how to assess that, actually, exactly. Um, I do see, over time, um, reflectivity and change in our students. And because our average students are here four or five or six or seven or eschatological plan forever, um, I have time to see change in them. David? So we uh, sit in uh, by the rivers of Washington. <laughs> the Potomac uh, and the Pasadena. Um, and the seminary was brought here to be in Washington. What's your hope for your for this seminary in this place. What you think, I guess, from what I've been chatting about this morning, which is that we would teach our students 
not to give up on or turn their vision from either the already or the not yet. Either from investing in what is possible nor from recognizing what isn't possible. From having a kind of chastened hope for what engagement in this world can do and bring, but that does not mistake that for our ultimate hope, which is that God really will break open the powers and principalities of this world and bring in actual righteousness and justice, and to have the deep spiritual disciplines and resources that can sustain that hope as a ground for a safe engagement in this world that doesn't risk either despair or idolatry. That's what I hope. Thanks so much, folks.